last month we began a new teaching series entitled Prepositional Faith. There's hopefully a slide coming up. I've challenged Jay to try and keep up with me today. I said she's actually going to have to listen to my sermon so that she knows what I'm talking about and what's, what slide we're on. It's an exploration of how Jesus relates to us and we've explored so far how God is with us by his incarnation in the birth of Jesus at Christmas. We have considered how God is for us by his atoning sacrifice in Jesus at Easter and over the next two weeks we'll explore how he is over us in uh, as one with authority and dominion because of the ascension of Jesus and finally how God is in us by the Holy Spirit poured out upon the church at Pentecost. And uh, if you've missed the first two episodes, you can catch up with them over our YouTube channel or on our podcast by searching St. John's Hoxton on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get them, and you can go back and listen to those. But before we dive into our exploration of the significance of the ascension of Jesus, I want to say a little bit more about why it's important for us to consider this question of how Jesus relates to us. And I want to begin with what's called the Copernican Revolution. The Copernican Revolution. Lovely. Um, And, sorry, that was unfair on Jade because it doesn't say Copernicus on the slide. It almost did, but it doesn't. Nicholas Copernicus was a Polish polymath. That is someone who knows quite a lot about almost everything. And he lived in the 15th to 16th century. More specifically, he was a mathematician and astronomer who spent a good deal of time trying to understand as much as he could about the nature of the universe. And it's important to remember that Copernicus was a Christian. He was, in fact, a canon of the Catholic Church, a kind of lawyer and official. He investigated the nature of the universe because he was captivated by the beauty of God's creation. But the work and theories of Copernicus, in due course, became better known through another Italian scientist who lived 100 years later, a man named Galileo Galilei. Now, one of Copernicus's big theories was known as heliocentrism, The theory that the earth revolves around the sun rather than the sun revolving around the earth. Now, no big deal, you might say. Pretty much everybody everybody nowadays believes that the earth revolves around the sun. Science has proved it. But back then, it was a more radical claim. And in the case of Galileo in particular, this claim seemed to undermine the account of of creation in Genesis. And Galileo was infamously interrogated by the Inquisition for advancing this Copernican theory about the earth revolving around the sun. Well, why do I tell you this story? Well, because I believe it illustrates something uh, that is a big problem for humankind. Most of us believe ourselves to be the sun at the center of the solar system of our lives, around which everything else revolves. This, in a way, is a good working definition of pride, to want to be like God. We tend to interpret most events in the world and in our lives with regard to how they affect us. Now, I struggle with this enormously. I want to be the hero of my own story. I'd also like to be the hero of everybody else's story too. And if heliocentrism is the theory that the earth revolves around the sun, then egocentrism is the theory that the world revolves around me. And egocentrism is a disease that affects humanity with epidemic proportions. Now, here's the thing. To become a follower of Jesus Christ means a denial of egocentrism. It's the determined resolve in both belief and behavior to let Jesus be the sun at the center of our solar system rather than us. It's our commitment to stop acting as if the universe revolves around us and to get ourselves out of the central starring role. In other language, we could say that we all have a throne in the throne room of our hearts, and most of us like to sit there all of the time, thank you very much. But to be a Christian is to get off the throne in the throne room of our hearts and let Jesus come and take his proper place. Uh, One more word about this and a brief illustration. What we're really dealing with here is the question of what is sometimes called subject object relations. This is a whole area of philosophy known as epistemology, and we're not going to go into that today, but it's a theory of knowledge. It's about how we know what we know. 
And in subject-object relations, the subject is the person who has agency or control over what they are observing or assessing, the object of their scrutiny. So if you look down a microscope at an organism, you are the subject and the organism is the object of your study. Make sense? But Christians must always be willing to be under the microscope, to be scrutinized by God. God is far too vast and transcendent to be contained by our scrutiny. Rather, this question of how Jesus relates to us in this prepositional faith series is another way of saying, how do we humble ourselves and understand how God in Jesus has chosen to deal with us? He is the one with authority, sovereignty, agency, and control. We are simply his handiwork. It's for us to receive from him a way to live based on his determinations, his decisions, rather than on our own. Now look, that's one word about the sort of philosophical side, but there's also an illustration, and it's not perfect, but it might help. Here's my illustration. We are the app, he is the operating system. Yeah? If your phone is anything like mine, you'll have an operating system which sits underneath, above and behind all the various apps that you use every day. And there's a risk for us that sometimes we treat our Christian faith a bit like one of the apps. That is, we open it from time to time when we think it will be helpful, but really it's just one app amongst several others that we access and use. And if you ignore the app for long enough, what happens? It might even offload itself. But my claim is that we need to understand our identity in Christ as the operating system, not the app. Our Christian faith and worldview is the system upon which all our other apps should run. So I'm making a claim here about the ultimate authority of God over our lives, a claim that is based in the ascension of Jesus. Talk about what that means to say God is over our lives. I remember when I first became a Christian, it used to be said to me that being a Christian meant accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And that's a phrase that I've pondered over the years. I wonder if you've accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I think it's interesting to consider both of the relationships claimed by that phrase, Lord and Savior. And I think it's easy for us to gravitate towards the Savior bit of the phrase. Because Jesus really does save us from ourselves. That's good news. He meets us at our point of need. If you're wounded, he can heal you. If you're enslaved, he can deliver you. If you're bereaved, he can comfort you. If you're lonely, he'll befriend you. If you have fear, he'll give you courage. If you despair, he'll give hope. If you're burdened by the stain of your sin and selfishness, he'll forgive you, clean you, and teach you how to love. There are so many ways in which Jesus does meet us at our point of need and is our saviour. However, that's about me and my need. So in a sense, it's intrinsically a selfish or self-oriented way to relate to Jesus. Now, the good news is that he is gracious, loving, and kind. Jesus knows what we need and is quick to come to us supplying hope and healing. But what about that other part of the phrase about how Jesus is Lord? That's an entirely different question. For this now is about him and about his authority rather than just my needs. So to say Jesus is Lord is to say that I am not. In other words, to accept Jesus as Lord, I have to surrender any claim or right to be in charge of my own life. Deep in our hearts, I believe that we all want to be master and commander of our own destiny. And to give that up to the Lordship of Jesus is a significant act of surrender. And this idea of submission to Jesus as Lord is at the very heart of the New Testament. The first apostles seem to see our submission to Jesus as a consequence of him being raised to sit at the right hand of God. So Ephesians 1 says, God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Now this phrase at the end of that 
scripture, placed all things under, is a Greek word, hupotasso. It's a compound word meaning to order or to place under or below. Hupotasso, to, to order below, to place under. It's a word that St. Paul uses on multiple occasions. And he wants it to, wants to show that our relationship to Jesus is as those who are under his authority and rule. So this idea of accepting Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior requires that we remember both halves. Savior, yes, but also Lord. It's there in the Apostles' Creed. Sorry, not the Apostles' Creed. It's there in the Nicene Creed. Missed time. It says this, for us and for our salvation. That's the Savior bit. He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Right? So you've got both in the Nicene Creed. For us and for our salvation, that's Jesus the Savior. He ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come and judge. Lord. The claim of the Bible and the claim of Christian faith through the ages is that because Jesus ascended into heaven, he has authority, rule, and lordship over our lives. In fact, the ascension turns out to have a lot to do with our everyday lives. So I want to consider Acts and the other Bible texts that help us make sense of all this. So what is the ascension? And I guess it's worth beginning by reminding ourselves that Acts is a companion volume to the Gospel of Luke. So the same author wrote and compiled two books, Luke and Acts. Simply put, Luke has to do with the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And Acts has to do with the birth of the church and its first years sharing the good news of Jesus. Luke is all about Jesus. Acts is all about us. I mean, it's all about Jesus as well, but it's also about us. And the closing chapters of Luke see the resurrected Jesus walking with, eating with, and teaching the disciples. It's actually depicted there, uh, seen from Luke 24 at the very back of our church. But right at the start of Acts, we see this extraordinary scene that Jen read for us, where just after teaching the disciples, Jesus is taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. That's verse 9. Then two angels appear, and they query why the disciples are all looking at the sky. And they explain that Jesus will return in the same way. In some religious art and buildings, this scene is comically uh, depicted with just two feet visible at the top of the picture on their way into the clouds as Jesus ascends. I've even seen church buildings and some chapels where they have a sculpture of this scene uh, on the ceiling. Imagine there where that angel is in, in the middle. Imagine if that was a, a sculpture with their two feet protruding from the ceiling as though going up into the roof void. It's quite a dramatic image. Now, I believe that to make sense of the ascension, we have to have in mind another dramatic passage from the Bible, the appearing of the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7. And the reason that we should have this in mind is that one of Jesus' most common ways of referring to himself is to call himself the Son of Man. We sometimes read it thinking that it's just another way of saying human, but Jesus has something else in mind. He knows that in the Jewish imagination of his day, the title Son of Man would summon up other meanings in his hearers' minds. So how does this phrase Son of Man appear in Daniel 7, and how does it link to the ascension in Acts? Have a look at the text. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Do you notice some of the similarities between Daniel and Acts? First, in Daniel, the Son of Man is somehow brought with clouds. In the Old Testament, God's glory and presence is described as being like a cloud. The Hebrew word Shekinah describes a cloud of God's presence. At the dedication of Solomon's temple, God's presence overwhelmed the priests. A cloud of God's presence overwhelmed the priests. In the wilderness, 
the Israelites were led by a pillar of cloud. In the New Testament, Paul describes Jesus' return in 1 Thessalonians 4 as being surrounded by clouds. He says this, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And once we've clocked the clouds in Acts 1, and we're reminded of Daniel 7 and all these other biblical motifs about God's glory, we then see other similarities. So the second point follows from the first, that Jesus is the one to whom is given all authority and dominion. So that along with all creation, we are hupertassoed, hupertassoed, if that's a verb. We are hupertassoed beneath him. That is, we are made subject and placed under his authority. And this is the same theme with which Jesus instructed his disciples at the end of Matthew's gospel. Let's read the text. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make, all, uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And what about Jesus' words to Mary at the end of John's gospel? Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. The ascension of Jesus establishes the lordship, authority, rule, and reign of Jesus over us and over all things. On the day of Pentecost, which we'll explore a little more next week. At the end of Peter's great sermon, he says this, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. That's the resurrection. Exalted to the right hand of God, this is the ascension, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Peter goes on to explain that the great King David, even great King David, did not ascend to heaven. And he says this so as to contrast it with Jesus who has ascended to heaven now that's all quite oh, full on is it all those bible texts and everything that's going on so let me say this as a, a quick aside I used to be really critical of that old chorus Lord I lift your name on high do you remember it Lord I lift your name on high we won't sing it all the way through now um, and Sarah knows well I used to like roll my eyes terrible theology I used to say I didn't like this section there's a section that says this you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth I don't know why I'm doing actions from the earth to the cross my debt to, I'm not going to make any more my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky Lord I lift your name on high well what's wrong with that you might say why didn't I like it well because it missed the bodily resurrection of Jesus the lyrics imply that Jesus went straight from the grave to the right hand of God when in actual fact he walked around for 40 days teaching his disciples in a resurrected body that still bore the marks of his crucifixion. But you know, I've softened. I think I might have changed my mind on the song. Perhaps I'm becoming sentimental in my old age. Um, perhaps I like the song a little more because it emphasizes the ascension of Jesus. And so few songs do emphasize the ascension. Although actually we sang one of my favorites today, I see the King of Glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes, amazing. But back to the Bible, and still on the theme of hymns or songs. Remember the famous hymn in Philippians 2 about the humility of Jesus? Well, how does it end? It ends with these words. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, it's focused on the ascension of Jesus to establish his authority and lordship over all things. He's not just our saviour meeting our needs. He's our Lord, the ruler of our lives. Now the ascension of Jesus hid from sight by the cloud also makes sense of two more things. Jesus said during, uh, two more things that Jesus said uh, before or during, after his arrest, during his trial in the Gospels. When being interrogated by the high priest just after his arrest, 
Jesus was asked, are you the Messiah? And this is how he responds. He says, I am, said Jesus. I think the text is on the screen. There we go. I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man, there's that phrase again, sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now at this, the high priest flies into a rage and tears his clothes, considering this claim to be blasphemy. Why does it sound like blasphemy? Well, because the high priest knows Daniel 7. He knows his scriptures. And he knows that Jesus is claiming the authority of the Son of Man. And the Bible says that the high priest and all those with him condemned Jesus as worthy of death. Another thing that Jesus said uh, to his disciples in those final days just before his crucifixion is this in Matthew 24. He says, then will appear the, si the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. There's the Son of Man, there's the clouds, there's the power and the glory. And he concludes his teaching by saying, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Now listen, over the years, many people have interpreted this teaching as being about the return of Jesus at the very end of time. But how then does it make sense for him to say to his disciples that their generation will not pass away before this happens? How can he say with confidence that people are going to see all this happening. Surely it's obvious that the disciples are going to die before they see the return of Jesus at the end of time. Well, what if Jesus wasn't teaching about the end of time? What if he was teaching about the establishment of his authority as the Son of Man, given all authority and dominion? What if this is all about the disciples who will witness his ascension into heaven, coming, appearing on and with the clouds of heaven? If Jesus is giving them a clue about his ascension, then this all begins to make more sense. I want to end this section with, uh, before concluding with one more observation about Scripture. The most frequently quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament is a little surprising. It's not anything from the Ten Commandments. It's not from Isaiah. It's not the psalm about the Lord being our shepherd. The most quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament is Psalm 110, specifically Psalm 110 verse 1, which says this, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And Jesus himself says in the Gospels that the Holy Spirit was inspiring David to write these words in the Psalms. Jesus says, David speaking by the Holy Spirit, said, the Lord said to my Lord. And you see that in this verse, there's a relationship between two figures, both described as Lord. And this is the beginning of the Christian understanding of who God is in his eternal nature, that he exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lordship of Jesus is established as a gift from the Father. The ascended Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father and exercises all authority and dominion. And it's the Holy Spirit who revealed this to David and inspired him to write the psalm. Well then, if we've established that the ascension of Jesus does demonstrate that he's not just our saviour, but he's also our Lord, ruling over us with authority and dominion, what then do we do in response? What does this all mean for us here and now? And the answer to that question is that if you want to find out, you'll have to buy this when it's published as a book. <laughs> uh, because I'm not going to read the next section of my script. This uh, teaching series of sermons um, I'm going to compile and put together. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the next section because it will take another 10 minutes. And I know none of us want that. So uh, all I will say is that I think there are four responses uh, that we can reflect on about the nature of God's authority about how our humanity is caught up with the humanity of Jesus in the presence of God, about the responsibility given us uh, to be ambassadors and emissaries for Christ here on earth, and finally, to have confidence in God's fidelity, his faithfulness to us, that he is with us even to the very end of the age. But for more detail, watch out for the book sometime next year.
the ascension of Jesus can be for us a Copernican revolution where we discover that Jesus is sovereign over all things rather than you and me. Instead of believing that everything revolves around us, we can observe Jesus ascended and seated on his heavenly throne and remember that it's actually about him and not about us. The ascension of Jesus is the vindication and the validation of his earthly mission. He really is the Messiah. He really is bodily resurrected. He really has overcome the old order of sin and death. We really are forgiven, healed, adopted as children of the living God. We are, as the old hymn puts it, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. It is true. It has happened. This is the singular most important event in human history. It's not good advice, it's good news. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. Amen. He is with us always, even to the very end of the age. How is he with us? He is with us by being in us, by his powerful presence, the Holy Spirit, poured out on the church at Pentecost and dwelling in us always. If you want to hear more about that, come back next week. Amen.